Hello, everyone. I want to apologize about the current audio. This was a last minute addition to the video after I heard the tragic passing of Max Payne's actor, James McCaffrey, whose impressive career is full of many intriguing characters. I would love to honor him before the video begins. In the world of video gaming, few voices have resonated as deeply as that of James McCaffrey. Today, we pay tribute to a man whose talent transcended the screen, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of gamers and fans worldwide. James McCaffrey, a multifaceted actor, lent his voice and soul to bring Max Payne to life, a character etched in the annals of gaming history. His portrayal was not just a performance, it was a journey through the complex tapestry of human emotions, capturing the essence of a character haunted by his past yet unyielding in the face of adversity. As we revisit the streets of New York through the eyes of Max Payne, each bullet time leap, every line delivered with gritty realism, we remember James McCaffrey. Not just for the voice that echoed through our speakers, but for the spirit and depth he brought to his roles. His departure leaves a void in the world of voice acting and motion capture, yet through his work he achieved a form of immortality. The stories he helped tell, the characters he brought to life, and the memories he created will continue to live on in the hearts of many. Today, we look back at the legacy of James McCaffrey, a man whose voice was more than just a part of a game. It was a part of our lives. And as we delve into the world of Max Payne once more, let's remember the artist who gave his character a voice, a presence, and a soul. James McCaffrey, you will be missed, but never forgotten. Your legacy lives on in every line, in every shadow of Max Payne's world, and in the hearts of all those you've touched through your remarkable talent. So I guess I'd become what they wanted me to be. A killer. Some rent-a-clown with a gun who puts holes in other bad guys. Well, that's what they had paid for, so in the end, that's what they got. Here I was, about to execute this poor bastard like some dime store angel of death. And I realized they were correct. Max Payne 3. It's a 2012 third-person action shooter game, being the third entry in the well-received series. It's such an energized experience, mirroring Hollywood blockbuster action and neo-noir elements from its predecessors. It was only a matter of time before I covered this and its badass character. So if you're new to this game series, the lead character, Max Payne, is a NYPD detective whose wife and baby is murdered by junkies high on a mysterious drug Valkyr in the first game. No! Once Max does his own investigation by slamming down painkillers and jumping around in slow-mo, he finds out a dark conspiracy on an organized crime linked to a secret society. A dark tale for sure that's guaranteed to get a shade darker in its sequel, The Fall of Max Payne. Both titles were critically acclaimed at the time and adored by gamers. They were developed by the team Remedy, who then handed the rights to the juggernaut studio, Rockstar, who eventually got to work on the next installment. The third game's development was very divisive, to say the least, as longtime fans were not happy with where their beloved character was going. From the black and white noir dripping atmosphere of yesteryear to the scorching harsh colors of reinvention, the fan outcry was deafening. The reactions mostly coming from early promotional stuff. It was originally announced in 2009 and targeted to release the same year but then went dark shortly after until 2011. The delay was from the devs to make some adjustments based on the fan backlash. Levels such as the New Jersey ones were added for nostalgia purposes, and Max's classic look 
was also added, but their best decision was to keep the long-standing voice actor of the series, James McCaffrey, after briefly discussing to replace him. I'm Jim McCaffrey. Uh, I was introduced to Sam uh, through doing the voice of Max Payne. And... You just don't listen, do you, asshole? <laughs> Which I don't know why was even a thought. I honestly don't think the game would have been as good. I can't envision anyone else as Max. Shit, I mean, look at how that worked for the 2008 film adaptation. Only given McCaffrey a blink and you miss moment. Jack Talianti, special agent, FBI. Being replaced by Mark Give me a goddamn second. Wahlberg was the least of that movie's problems. During the time of the delay, there was reports of mismanagement and employee mistreatment behind the closed doors of Rockstar. The game went through no less than three rewrites and had the dev team pulling 16-hour workdays with no days off. It eventually became a project that required all the attention of the massive studio. With a beefy $105 million price tag, it, at the time, with Rockstar's other titles, became one of their biggest projects. When the game released in May of 2012, it was met with the same praise as its predecessors, with most of the acclaim going to its updated bullet time mechanics, gripping story, James McCaffrey's performance. My problem, my problem, wanna know what my problem is? You're turning humans into glue. That's what my fucking problem is. The fans for the most part enjoyed the game with some of the criticisms still being present on Max's new look and its deviation from the original style and story, which seem like just minor gripes as I don't think it impacts the overall game. I do think the game suffers from being a bit short and I was never a fan of the gunshot marks Max can get while in gameplay. It kind of becomes immersion breaking, but it's bombastic action, fun gameplay, and likable lead made it hard for me to put the controller down. Surprisingly, Remedy's Sam Lake, the series' original creator, was pretty happy with the direction Rockstar was aiming for. Although he did say if the game was back in Remedy's hands, it could have turned out quite different, which is an interesting thought. I was a day off the sauce for the first time in years and knew I was due a hangover sent direct from Mother Nature. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the character and gameplay, let's discuss the foundation on this sequel. We find Max, nine years later, who's, let's just say, more worse for wear than usual. After getting into another scrape with a New Jersey Mafia, which seems to be Max's daily activities at this point. He's offered a security job from a gun for hire buddy, Passos, to protect a very wealthy family, the Broncos, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. But in true fashion for the character, becomes more than he bargained for, as he finds himself once again centered in another corrupted system, filled with double crosses, organized crime militias, human organ harvesting, I am a doctor. I help people. What have you been doing here? It's easy for you. Listen, I know people. They will kill you. I can help you. Trust me. Please, please. What have you been doing? And lots, lots of carnage. And to add a cherry on top of this shit pile, Max is a stranger in a strange land. A fish out of water. So yeah, it's just another day for this guy. Basically overtime, but no extra pay. The setting is a far cry away from what fans are used to. Sao Paulo is blistering and muggy. You get a good representation of the area, being mostly between expensive scenery and rundown slums both being greatly used in some of the funnest shootouts, mainly an office level that has you going berserk and a condemned building level that gives you a puny option on stealth. It wasn't pretty, 
but I guess none of what was about to happen was gonna be. And let's not forget the airport with the bumping tears blasting away amongst the chaos. Which is another positive note I'd like to mention. The game's soundtrack is something I tend to love more every time I replay it. It has an energetic quality that can be adrenaline pumping, and then before you know it, it's slowed down with a philosophical hum to match the downward spiral of Max nearing his twilight years. The developers conducted field research around the actual Sao Paulo area, capturing footage for the design team, ensuring that the culture and every element was authentic as possible, even going to great lengths at studying the gangs and police force. Though after the game's release, Brazilian reviewers criticized the depiction, with many feeling it paints Sao Paulo in a negative light. I personally think it fits the tone with Max being a foreigner, so he's definitely going to view that area and most hostile locals in a different frame of mind. I was deep in gang territory. These kids were raised hating clowns like me, middle-income ass kickers who protected the rich by shooting kids like them. The visual style was another element that was met with mixed responses, mostly the glitch effects, with some enjoying and others downright hating. I guess I sit in the camp of the former as I felt it gave us a glimpse in the psyche of Max. Though not an original effect in the world of film, from research it seems the game borrowed the style from a film called City of God. But to me, it mostly resembles Tony Scott's 2004 film, Man on Fire, starring Denzel Washington. In segments of that film, the character Creasy goes through these hyper-realism flashes when experiencing adrenaline, vengeance, and near death. Scott had a particular directing style that made him recognizable in the world of film. The technique is unofficially known as Tony Vision, where the footage becomes hyper-reality from the hand-cranking of the camera. The editing becomes quick cuts and overexposed, with all colliding to a disorientating state as every emotion is greatly exaggerated or significantly reduced. Tony stated with his work on Man on Fire, that was by the style dictated by the character or by the world I'm touching. Um, and on Man on Fire, said if Denzel thinks it, feels it, I'll show it, I'll communicate it with mm -hmm. use of, and no rules, with use of camera, whether there's a hand crank, mm -hmm. and so if he felt it, I'd show it. You know, so mm -hmm. that was, that's what every movie I always find, I find a concept that I'll, mm -hmm. that I'll, um, I thought one line on top of my storyboards every morning. <laughs> yeah. If he thinks it, show mm -hmm. it. It's easy to attribute the distorting effects as what Max is currently going through with his addiction to booze and painkillers. It can also be because of the corrupted state of Sao Paulo and the lawlessness that runs amok. These glitches elevate when Max goes cold turkey after years of boozing. I'm sure it's very distracting for most people, but I tend to find it immersive with the character and how it personifies his struggle on screen. Here I was again, halfway down the world, and still looking at the bodies of women I was supposed to protect. Only difference now is, I didn't understand the language. Rockstar's president, Sam Hauser, said this about Max when approaching the third installment. This is Max as we've never seen him before. A few years older, more world-weary, and cynical than ever. Something funny about dying? I felt like the avenging angel. I looked like a fat, bald dude with a bad temper. Which is probably the best description. He's in a different climate, a different world, a different headspace. A broken man in an even more broken place, where he literally has to rely on his detective skills and happy trigger fingers to stay alive. What drew me to the character almost instantaneously is his balance of being a sympathetic everyman. I owe, I owe, I owe you everything. No, you don't. 
I'm sorry I couldn't save your sister. While being a ruthless badass. I'll tell you what I got. I got a gun, and if anybody thinks they're gonna take it from me, they'd be dead wrong. It makes the character much more likable, especially since I didn't play the previous two games when it released. So it's a great mixture of excellent writing and stellar acting. A good example is at the end of chapter 6, instead of killing a severely wounded goon, Max has the good grace to at least get him out of a burning building. Sure, it's a long stretch to see if the guy made it, but it's just the action. Max didn't have to help him, but he chose to which attributes a lot to his characterization. After all he's been through, he's not completely cold-hearted, pressing on but never letting go. He sums this up best in six words. Time moves forward and nothing changes. Locking himself in his own internal hell that just so happens to be 4,742 miles south of New Jersey, trying to protect the women that he couldn't long ago, still failing even with the Broncos. Max's loyalty pushes him in great danger. Even while grumbling about protecting the Broncos, he makes it clear that whatever their flaws, regardless, he was paid to protect them. At the start of the game, Rodrigo Bronco's wife, Fabiana, is kidnapped by a criminal gang called the Commando Sombre. Through half the game, Max tears through Sao Paulo just to find her coming frustratingly close to finally freeing her before the game awards us the same luck as Mr. Payne himself. What a gut punch. Not only does it shock you, but you basically were in the shoes of Max through the majority of trying to save Fabiana. So in terms of being immersed with the character, I think Rockstar did a good job making sure you still felt for him. It also makes the pursuit of Fabiana's sister, Giovanna, more personal, and again shows how far Max is willing to go to risk his own life. In a 2012 interview with Polygon, Rob Nelson of Rockstar says the company set out to make the most cinematic shooter they could deliver, while staying true to the previous titles and Max himself, which after much friction from the fan base, the company welcome back McCaffrey to the iconic character. Not only to voice Max again, but to straight up provide full performance capture. When brought up the age and movement of Max at this stage of his life, Nelson responds, I think we really wanted to get that. I think stuff like the shoot dodging, you do leaps and bullet time. If it's fairly frantic, we have a different set of animations at play. So if you're still pushing the left stick forward and you leap, you'll land and he'll sort of scramble and stumble to his feet. It feels good. It also looks plausible. It looks like this is something that's hurting this guy. Criticism was much more heated on the character shaving his hair off halfway through the game. Nelson elaborates that Max's bald look wasn't much of a big deal for the team. To them, it was definitely a decision they thought serves the story and wasn't to get long-term fans upset. And come on, you know that Hawaiian shirt is badass. I got the best. I know. Max Payne is kind of pioneering in the world of video games mainly for its use of the game mechanic known as bullet time. Popularized by The Matrix in 1999 and its mixture of crazy action and John Woo's films, translates so well in these games that you almost feel like you're in a ballistic action movie. This slow-mo mechanic is complemented by a kill cam that allows you to slow the bullets cinematically as they eviscerate its targets. The destructible set pieces that are given at your disposal are outrageous. The nightclub action sequence reminded me of the scene from Collateral. 
and the challenging stadium level made me kind of think of Money Talks, strangely. Sure, there's nothing much revolutionary about the controls of the third game, besides being modified from the original, but I think Rockstar decided instead of replacing what already works, they increased the significance of it, giving you a hammer and telling you that everything is nails. It provides the freedom of indulging in the chaos. Compared to Rockstar's other properties that have an open world experience, Max Payne 3 is like their first real linear experience. I think it was a game they really wanted to have fun with, and with the extra GTA 4 cash just lying around at the time, what better game to go bananas with? It's pretty much the reason I keep replaying this game. Aside from Max's story, it's very satisfying laying a headshot or just destroying everything around you in a hell of bullets. Powerful people. Well, your powerful people aren't gonna help you out of this one, buddy. This was it. It was almost over. Ten years later, and this game still rocks. It has received much warmer reception with its fans over time, with many claiming it as a perfect bookend to Max's story. He takes down the corrupted officials and liberates the poor slums of Sao Paulo. He finally walks out into the sunset, living his new life, a solid trilogy. You know I walk. You walk <laughs> with a lift! A man that's experienced suffering and as cliche as it sounds, pain. Finally moving on with his life and has been left untouched since. There have been whispers of a sequel for many years, but nothing too official. Remedy and Rockstar, however, confirmed full remakes of the first two Max Payne games, all under the care of Rockstar. It was fun covering this game and its renowned main character, and hopefully soon we get a sequel. But if we don't, I'm fine with the closure Max was given. Happy birthday, Max Payne.